minus 20 seconds. 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Conversation, Sunday, October 11th. Peace be with you. Good to see you. Man, I hate that this be happy is always on the other side of this mug. All right, there we go. Be happy. That's our, uh, that's our Sunday message. Well, not really, but that's how we're going to start off the show. Good morning, Ted. Good to see you, Libby. Uh, I know you're uh, not far. <laughs> good to see you. Uh, it's a beautiful day here, uh, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Carrie, good morning. And uh, man, it has, we've had great weather like the last week. And uh, people have just been out and doing things outside. I know that some of my friends uh, messaged me yesterday and said they went for a bike ride for the first time in like five years. So people are uh, doing their best to stay hopeful and, you know, that's what we'll, that's all we can do. But uh, beautiful fall colors uh, here right now. Like yesterday, uh, I just went for a walk. I took Bailey for a walk, and I had no uh, no really other agenda. Like it wasn't for her; it was really for me. And I walked down to our community lake, and I just wanted to pray my rosary there. And you know, it was just beautiful. And uh, I actually posted on Facebook. I think people thought I was. Uh, losing my marbles, but uh, you know, my only prayer yesterday was gratitude. Not because I was so sad that that's all I could pray, but I just really wanted to be grateful. And uh, I just looked around and I thought, man, this stuff is just so incredibly beautiful. And I have so much to be thankful for. And no, nothing is perfect, but it is as it should be. So, uh, you know, in this time of year, I think that that's what fall, you know, fall is getting us to settle in. I think that many people are looking forward to a close in 2020, <laughs> but I love fall more than anything. And when I used to be on the road a lot, I'm not on the road this year, but I would be on the west end of the country and I always missed fall when I was away from home because the colors weren't as brilliant, uh, you know, in some parts of the south and uh, I'm, I'm happy to be home. I am happy to be home and enjoying that. So good morning. Peace be with you, Eric, Dottie. Good to see you. Thanks for joining in. If you're checking in today and you're part of the Coffee and Conversation uh, community this morning, I'd love for you to just let us know where you're from and uh, checking in from what city, what state, even if you don't want to say anything else the rest of the time, uh, just let us know where you're from and uh, maybe how you're doing this morning. So Angela, good to see you. I know the whole Wait family tunes in for our different coffee and conversations. Uh, so we are blessed to have you. Tina, good to see you. Good morning to you. Uh, so good morning. Peace be with you. Uh, we have a great topic today. And it's about being invited to the party. This is what our, our, our readings this week are about, what the party offers, Right? And when I explained to you about this party that we're going to go to, when I explained to you about the guests, that uh, what they're going to get to enjoy, I don't think that there's not a party in the world that we wouldn't want to attend that is as great as this Super Bowl of Super Bowl parties, right? And, and that's where our readings lead us. But I had a thought, an interesting thought. I have lots of thoughts. I had a thought. There are lots of times. I'm kind of a homebody. I like to be at home. I'd rather be in my PJs or my sweats um, and kind of chilling out and relaxing. And so every once in a while, you get that invitation to a party. You know it's going to be fun. You know people are going to be there that you know. Uh, but at the same time, you really don't want to go. Uh, you are just sitting at home and you're thinking, you know what? I'm just comfortable where I am. I really don't want to get all dressed up and, and have to go. And so one of two things happens. Either you finally get off of the couch and you go and you have a great time. And once you're there, you end up probably being the last person to leave because it was exactly what you needed and it was great. Or you end up not going 
and the next day you hear from all of your friends that were there about how wonderful it was. The great food, excuse me, the great food they had, the drinks, how somebody came in from out of town that you hadn't seen in a while, and then you kick yourself in the butt and you're like, man, I really wish that I would have gone to the party. And so today as we read these readings, uh, we are getting a foretaste of this party, this banquet, this eternal joy, uh, not only that is foretold by what our host will give us in the book of Isaiah, but in Matthew's gospel, it shows us how few people are really willing to come to the banquet that God is preparing. And uh, yes, Eric, uh, I will uh, show up. Matter of fact, uh, if you've ever been invited to my home as part of either staying over or different events, you know that I will tell you, uh, it's okay to come in your PJs or your sweats, for real, because at some point during the night, I'm going to go upstairs and change, and I'm going to get in mine. So, uh, and it's going to be before you leave. So, uh, yeah, go to the party in your PJs. So, all right. Well, welcome. If you're just joining us, good morning. Welcome to Coffee and Conversation. I want to get into this week's readings. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, go ahead uh, and open them up. Uh, we're going to start in the book of Isaiah, chapter 25. So we're going to go to chapter 25, verse 6. Uh, if you want to run and grab your Bible, that's cool. If you need a second to take the dust buster and, uh, you know, make sure you get all that dust off, that's cool too. No judgment. I can't see you. You can see me. But uh, I have my shirt on today. You'll know why I'm wearing that. If you read ahead, you'll know why I'm wearing it. But uh, So yeah, let's open up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 6. You know what? I'm going to set my coffee over here. Again, a useless fact that you don't need to know. All right, so here's what I want to remind everybody about Isaiah. And especially if any of you do ministry work or are trying to share the love of Christ with other people, we get frustrated that we can see things that God allows us to share in before other people. Um, and sometimes we want to tell people about our love of God, but they, they're not willing to receive it or they can't see it the same way that we do. And so I was thinking about that with Isaiah uh, today, because I always have to remind myself that what Isaiah wrote uh, was 700 years, roughly, before Christ was born. So 700 years, Isaiah is talking about all this amazing stuff that is going to happen. And he's thinking, like, it's going to be soon, right? But it's like 700 years later. So if I told you that you had to do something today, that was going to benefit Christ, but people wouldn't realize it for 700 years, would you still do it? And the answer is, you got to be excited and say yes. Uh, I feel guilty about it all the time because I do things that I'm like, Lord, you told me to do this, but I don't think anybody cares. And I don't think anybody believes me. And it's like, well, Greg, but their kids will. And I'm like, yeah, but I won't be here. But it's not up to me. So anyway. Off my horse. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 25. This is going to be verses uh, 6 to 10. It says, On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will provide for all peoples a feast of rich food and choice wines, juicy rich food and pure choice wines. So right at the beginning, Isaiah tells us that this is a feast for everybody. This isn't just like, hey, for those who are perfect, for those who uh, feel holier than somebody else. No, this is a feast for all people. And he says, not only is there going to be good food and rich wine, but it's like juicy food, like not stale bread. Like this is going to be meat that is incredibly juicy and that you want. And the, and the wines, they're not going to be, you know, it's no Boone's Farm. This isn't like two buck chuck, man. These are pure choice wines. We're going to get the richest of the wines. And it says that on this mountain, he will destroy the veil that veils all people, the web that is woven over all nations. Now, when you read this, he's telling us that this is for all people. 
there was a veil uh, in the Holy of Holies. So the Holy of Holies is where the tabernacle was in the Old Testament. And one day out of the year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies, but there was always a veil between the people and the Holy of Holies that held uh, the ark with everything that was in it, uh, from the manna to the staff of Aaron um, and the Ten Commandments. But there was a, there was a veil between, between them and the people, and only the high priest got to enter. But this veil is going to be destroyed, and there is going to be, God is going to be tangible for all people uh, to connect with him. Um, and all people will be connected as children of God. So that's what we're saying there. It says, the Lord God will wipe away the tear, will wipe away the tears from every face. The reproach of his people he will remove from the whole earth, for the Lord, the Lord has spoken. Now, when I thought about this part, because uh, I underlined certain things, it says, the Lord God will wipe away the tears from every face. There is a connection in an ability for us to be in communion with Christ. And that's really what he's speaking about here, that there is this communion of Christ. He's prophesying 700 years before Jesus comes that you won't feel the same pain that you feel today because there isn't a God that you have to fear. There isn't a God that you're trying to please in a different way, you're going to have a God that you're in communion with. And so there won't be a sadness that you're waiting for a Savior anymore. We don't have to wait for what all the Israelites had to wait for. He was saying the time is here and you won't weep waiting for something great because it will be among you. And on that day it will be said, Behold our God to whom we looked to save us. This is the Lord God for whom we looked. Let us rejoice and be glad, for he has saved us. Behold our God to whom we look to save us. So let me think about that in today's society. How many people right now in a world of unrest that um, is continually put forth in our face by the media? So many people say to me all the time, well, what are we supposed to do? Well, there's nothing we can do. We're screwed. This, this world is, is lost. Like, people are crazy. And I say that too sometimes. But when we say, what can we do? We have to remember that we have to look to a God who can save us. It's only when we are willing to finally say, Lord, I give you everything. I give it all, I give it all to you. And I trust that you will provide for me everything that I need. It's only then that we are saved. We can't do it on our own. And then it ends with, for the, land, the hand of the Lord will rest on the mountain. So our first reading in, the, in Isaiah, he's depicting what it will look like. He's depicting what will happen when the Savior finally comes. And I'm sure that so many people waited and waited and held faith in what they couldn't see. But when the day finally came, how many people couldn't see Christ that was right before them? So many people waited their entire lives for the Savior. But yet, even after Jesus was born, even once he started his ministry at 30 years of age, people still couldn't see the living God right in front of them. And so it gives us some insight as to what Paul is to remind people of, that how a life in Christ, no matter where we are right now, is going to be amazing. And so I'd like you right now to turn to the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. So we are going to Philippians chapter 4, and I'm going to have you turn to verse 12. This is Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. The entire letter that Paul writes to the Philippians is beautiful. Uh, I would invite you to maybe take this week and read the entire letter to the Philippians. I think it's only four chapters or five. Um, but the entire letter 
gives you an understanding of some of the great things that Paul is reminding the people of, of what a life in Christ brings us. So here we are, chapter 4 in the letter to the Philippians, verse 12. Brothers and sisters, I know how to live in hum humble circumstances. I also know how to live with abundance. So right away, Paul's saying, Paul is saying, using the word humble, for uh, I know what it's like to be poor, and I know what it's like to live in abundance. The one thing I don't know, I like to think that Paul is talking about that physically, but I also think that he's talking about it spiritually. And most people would probably say, well, that is what he means, is that it means spiritually. And where there's hope for you and I is that no matter why you're watching this morning, no matter where you are in your faith journey, you might be completely empty. You might have been the most faithful person in the world, but you can't see God in the storm. That's okay. You may never have entered a church or said a prayer in your life today, but I want to invite you to think about that relationship differently because even Paul knew what it was like to persecute Christ. And then some of you are blessed to say, you know what, I am on the highest mount and I am right there with Christ. He has revealed himself to me and I read scripture every day and I am living in this great life. And that's wonderful too. But so many people are just working to find God in their life and they don't know how to do it. And so Paul connects with us and he's like, look, I know what it's like to live humble or poor. And I know what it's like to live in abundance. In every circumstance and in all things, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry. So there's a secret to all this. Of living in abundance and of being in need. So no matter where we are, what are we learning in this simple fact? There's a secret to appreciate that when you have little, that you can still move forward. There is a secret that when you have an abundance of things that you are still able to live with them and share them with other people. No matter what situation you're in, there is a secret. And, and the secret is to say that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This aspect of what Paul is telling us, which is the shirt, I can do all things, right? I can do all things through God who strengthens me. Philippians 4.13 tells us that the secret is that everything that we have, even if it's the smallest amount, that no matter where we are, we have to give the glory to God. We have to live a life in Christ in order for us to fully live the secret of why we're in the situation we're in and how we can grow in our faith. How we can grow in relationship and how we stop and pause and say, I own nothing. You know, I, I wasn't on last week uh, because Misha passed away on, sat on Saturday and uh, you didn't want me on Sunday. I mean, you did maybe, but I couldn't do it. <laughs> that, that's as easy and plain to see. But as I sat in Mass, I did go to church on Sunday, and as I sat in Mass, I had this realization, and I might have talked about this earlier than the week, it's been a long week, but that we don't own anything. We don't. Everything that we have is a gift from God. Um, whether it's our motorcycle, whether it's the money we have, whether it's our talent to be a great baker, whether it's our pets, whether it's our spouses, our children, None of it is ours. You can love nothing more that God has created for goodness than God loves it. And we have the ability to be the stewards to take care of it. And so if we don't include God in the abundance, if we don't ask for God's help in the time of humility and lack thereof of material things, we're not going to get through anything. The only thing that gave me peace about losing Misha last week was she was made by God for God to return to God. And that he took her back to his creation place in heaven 
and that we got to hold her and be with her for seven years. I believe we'll be reunited one day again in heaven. Uh, but that gave me comfort. And so Paul reminds us that you can, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Even if I lose, I can still handle this because Christ strengthens me. And then he tells his readers, still it was kind of you to share in my distress. It's like when somebody talks to you and they're like, man, I'm so sorry that happened to you. And you're like, you know what? It's okay. God's will be done and I'm going to be all right. But thanks for, thanks for telling me that you were concerned. And then we move on to chapter, or I'm sorry, verse 19. Uh, verse 19 in chapter 4 of Philippians. May God willfully supply whatever you need in accord with his glorious riches in Christ. To our God and Father, glory forever and ever. Amen. Um, you know, I, God will supply what we need. And I haven't talked about our retreat center lately and what we've been working on. Uh, for those of you who watch regularly, um, we have been working on uh, developing a ministry retreat center uh, through a property purchase uh, that we've been working on since June. It has not gone as planned. There have been many ups and downs. But we are finally at a place that on October 20th, there will be a vote for us to get our permit by the city. And if that happens, uh, we will close on the, on the purchase and we will begin to move forward on that. Why do I bring this up? I bring it up because I haven't talked about it a lot. And I've been very sheepish about when people even ask me about it because I am uh, afraid to tell people about the updates and then it's not going to happen because there's still a chance it could fall apart. So I'm afraid to tell people about that. I'm not doing that anymore starting today. I woke up today and I'm going to live my life as everything is going to go according to God's will. And if it doesn't work out on October 20th, then we'll move forward. But I'm not going to pretend like I have to wait until God reveals himself to me before I start planning for the future that I think he's called us into. Because I believe it's all of God. I believe the entire choice to move down this route has been part of God's plan. So I have to follow him, and I have to follow him with joy. And that's what Paul tells us. No matter what happens, you can do all things through Christ, and he will supply you whatever you need. And he has proven that to me time and time again. And so I'm not going to sell him short by not fully trusting in his plan. And I can do it with humility, and I can also do it with abundance. So I'm going to ask that you pray for us on that venture, um, but for you, Wherever you are in your life right now, I want you to know that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And if you've never even offered yourself over to the Lord, if you do that, I promise you that he will be with you in a journey that you thought you couldn't handle before. And if you haven't given him the beauty of the abundance, then you're missing out on allowing him to fully own what he owns already and that you've just been entrusted with it. Now, I bet you didn't think there was that much in that reading, but that's the way that, um, that's the way I want you to think about it moving forward. Uh, we have to know how to live in abundance and we have to know how to live in humility. It shouldn't just be one and we shouldn't only praise God when things are good. All right, so then we move forward. So we have Isaiah talking about how beautiful the party is going to be and all the great stuff that's going to be there. We have Paul reminding us that God owns everything and we can do everything if we just allow him to be part of it. And now we move on to, the, to Matthew's gospel, uh, chapter 22, right at the beginning, verses 1 to 14. Uh, so go ahead, first gospel. Remember Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So when you're flipping to your Bible... Matthew's the first one. Uh, this is chapter 22 and uh, verses 1 to 14. I might skip around a little bit, but uh, we got this. All right. So this is the parable of the wedding feast. So this is the culmination of what Isaiah foretold. And now we're hearing the parable about what it's likened 
to people who don't want to accept the invitation to go to this party. All right, Isaiah gave us the details. He sent out the invite 700 years earlier. I mean, how about that? What if you got a party? Like if I sent out an invitation for April, you'd be like, oh my gosh, that's for April. But Isaiah, he sent out an invitation like 700 years prior to the party. Um, put that on your fridge. All right, here we go. So it says, Jesus again in reply spoke to the chief priests and the elders of the parables saying, so right away, his audience, the chief priests and the elders. These are the people that think that they know everything, but they're really not recognizing Christ as the Son of God among them. And they're pretty obstinate. So he's going to tell them the parable. So like, hey, know-it-alls, let me remind you of this. It says, the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. The king is God. The wedding feast is for his son, Jesus Christ. He dispatched his servants to summon the invited guests to the feast, but they refused to come. So Christ comes, the apostles are trying to gather everybody up, and uh, a lot of people don't want to come. A lot of people that say they're holy, a lot of people that are devout in their religion uh, of Judaism, they don't want to see the Savior among them. A second time he sent the other servants, tell those who are invited, Behold, I have prepared my banquet. My calves and my fattened calves are killed and everything is ready. Come to the feast. Some ignored the invitation and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, and then the rest, so some ignored it, and then it tells us the rest laid hold of his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. So we have a double reference here that we can look to. We can look to the prophets like Jeremiah who were beaten up and spit on, who try to foretell of the party. And then we have martyrs of faith, people who have died for the love of Christ, people who were willing to give their life, trying to tell people to come to Christ, to come into this wedding feast, to give your life over because it's going to be the greatest thing that you'll ever experience. And what was their reward? Some were beaten, some were killed, and a lot of people ignored it. So in this story, the king was enraged, and now he sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. Kind of like Sodom and Gomorrah, right? Then he said to his servants, Look, the feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy to come. So it's like when you make the perfect prime rib and people are late to your party, you're like, look, I'm serving dinner. I can't wait anymore. Uh, who's ever here is going to be here. And now we've reached that point where the king is like, look, everything's ready. There's nobody here. Go out into the streets. And the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they found, good and bad alike. Flip that. Bad and good alike. And the hall was filled with guests. So when the servants go out to bring people to Jesus, when they go out to bring people to God and to welcome them to the banquet of our Lord, it isn't like we go, hey, are you perfect? All right, you come. Or hey, are you uh, broken? All right, you come. It's like, look, everybody come, because there is an amazing feast that the king has prepared, and we need guests. He wants everybody to be part of this, and there's so many people that said no already. It doesn't matter where you are, because if you're bad, you won't ever want to leave this and you'll convert your life. If you're good, you will know that why you've lived a good life. Um, but when the king came to guests, he saw a man there not dressed in the wedding garment. And the king said to him, my friend, how is it that you came in here without a wedding garment? But he was reduced to silence. Now, originally when I used to read this, I would be like, why does it matter that the guy's not wearing the garment? Why does it matter, like, he came? Like, all these other people wouldn't come. Why does this guy have to wear the garb? Shouldn't you just be happy he's there? In Scripture, when we go into it, it tells us that um, mercy. We have to be clothed in uh, a willingness to serve. And this man represents people who will show up to the party 
but they don't do what it takes in order to live a life worthy of the banquet. These are people that show up to the party and they're like, yeah, I'm just here to take a few things. I'm just here to show up. It's kind of like when we go to church and we show up at church and we just um, sit there and we don't really participate. It's like being at the, at the feast but not being willing to dress up. It's like the guy who comes to your Halloween party who refuses to wear a costume. You're like, get out, man. We're having fun here. But this guy is, is unwilling to be part of it. He's like, I want to enjoy the food and the drink, but I'm not wearing your outfit. And so the king, he says to his attendants, bind his hands and feet and cast him into the darkness where there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. Many in, are invited, but few are chosen. Again, when I used to read this, I would think that the uh, I don't want to live a life apart from all the goodness that he gives us. If we are thrown outside of the party for not being willing to, willing to participate and that door will not be reopened, that is why there'll be wailing and grinding of teeth. There will be nothing that we can do to get back into the feast because we've chose, chosen to separate ourselves from God. We chose not to wear what he asked us to wear in the way that we lived our lives. This man came to the feast and chose not to wear the garment. So now living outside, there's wailing and grinding of teeth of all the people who realized that this was the feast of feasts and the banquet of banquets. And if they just would have listened, they would have had an eternity feasting on all the things that they love, but instead they're outside wailing and grinding of teeth. So this week, this aspect that we are invited has to be the theme. This wailing and grinding of te teeth has to be the theme that you and I know that we will accept the invitation, and not only will we accept the invitation, but that you and I are willing to do what it takes once we are invited to be the great guest that God wants us to be. So don't just accept the invitation to the party, but be willing to be the guest who is the one who will do all the things to enjoy it as well. My friends, we have a great week ahead of us. Let's remember that Christ will be everything that we need and that we can do all things through him who strengthens us. Philippians 4.13. Let that be your mantra this week and read the rest of Philippians. And then when it's all said and done, I want you to sit back and wonder if you're, really, if you're really wearing what you need to wear to the feast that you've been invited to, and I will do the same. We'll be back tomorrow morning at 7.30. Thanks for spending some time with me. Make sure that you go to church today if you haven't. This is only an aspect to explain the readings, but you still need your community, and you still need the ability to celebrate the Eucharist as a Catholic Christian or to get your scripture from your pastor if you go to another denomination of Christian churches. So God bless you. God keep you. I look forward to seeing you this week. And I know that he will meet you everywhere that you desire him always. Libby will be with us on Monday morning at 730 for a little Monday motivation. We'll see you later. God bless. Take care.